Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Going to be a cool show today. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a sort of a legend UFO hunter. I mean, this guy's a former police officer, trained observer. Uh, you know, he's uh, been researching UFOs for 35 years. He's had TV programs like Alien Highway. He's written books. He's got a cool blog. We were chatting with the UFO nut himself, Mr. Chuck Zukowski. And uh, Jason, you've chatted with him before, right? Early on in UAP Studies podcast life? Yeah, uh, early on. He was actually gracious enough to uh, join me when uh, I first started the podcast. And I was by myself, complete loser. Nobody was listening to me. And he still came on the podcast and did, uh, I think, two interviews with us at, at the time. So it's great to you know, come full circle now that everybody's here, uh, have him back on again and, and get to talk with him again. For sure. Yeah. And I'm sure it promises to be an interesting episode. Chuck's always got lots to say. And uh, he's a fact based guy. He doesn't get too out there with opinion, but goes where the evidence is. He's our kind of guy. So we'll be right back with Mr. Chuck Zukowski. Let's do this. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of UAP Studies Podcast. My name is Louis Borges. Joining me as always, my good friend and illustrious co-host, Jason Gilmatt. How are you? Good. I'm doing very good. How are you? I'm good. This is yeah. an evening recording, which we don't usually do, so it's kind of feels different. It's dark outside in wintertime, but... Uh, I'm a little thrown doing... off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're still doing what we do. We're talking to big-name people, really intelligent minds, trained observers, in fact, no more trained observer uh, would be a police officer. We have a former one who knows the stigma that, you know, is associated with discussing this topic or even researching this kind of thing. And uh, a lot of you might recognize him from shows like um, Alien Highway and books written about him, like the 37th Parallel. So uh, we're very excited to have back on the show again, uh, Mr. Chuck Zukowski. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me on your show. And Thanks for pronouncing my last name correctly. <laughs> is it Polish? Uh, it is. It's uh, well, actually it's Polish Russian, depending on that time of a century where uh, either Russia occupied Poland, or sure, <laughs> Poland occupied Poland. But uh, uh, it's it's kind of. I'm actually uh, a Mexican Polak, so uh, heard the same joke twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two Polacks walking the bar, two Mexicans. Walk in a bar. It's an interesting thing. My dad was Polish and uh, my mom, uh, not Hispanic, Mexican. So, uh, uh, you know, kind of grew up in a kind of a rich environment. You know, Polish sausages rolled up in tortillas. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> Hybrid food at its best. That's you bet. You colon bet. blockers, if anything, right? <laughs> yes. So what got you into UFOs and all this crazy stuff? I mean, you had a normal job. You were a police officer. Uh, regular dude and then what happened actually um the the police officer stuff that it was a volunteer i was a volunteer deputy sheriff for eight, eight years um i've always been a, a ufo investigator a researcher for probably oh, about 35 years uh my day job is uh i see mass design engineer i design microchips so i've been doing that just over 30 years and so as a ufo investigator uh, being involved in microchip design and some of the projects I've been on from uh, spy satellites, to DOD projects to uh, LIDAR systems and something as simple as just, uh, traffic light controllers. It gives me an opportunity of seeing what technology we should have and the technology we should have in the next you know, decade or so compared to some of the technology that's flying around out there. And, uh, so it's really interesting. I get a little bit better perspective. When I became a, a deputy, uh, I learned other things too, which was, you know, which was really helpful in the UFO community, which is basically learning to read people's, uh, you know, uh, faces and, and, and voices and, and, and the way they move their, uh, you know, uh, their body language, basically, uh, it really helps out because in some cases when you're interviewing someone, you can tell pretty pretty much if they're maybe not telling the whole truth or or you know or or just basically lying just just based on on you know their body movements and stuff. But 
it, it also helped me out being a, a deputy from being a UFO investigator because I've talked to so many people as an investigator. Uh, I have that gift of gab. So it was really easy for me as a deputy. And I think out of the eight years, I didn't really write a lot of tickets. I was being a volunteer. I was more concerned uh, about enlightening and teaching people. And unless they really did something, you know, really wrong, you know, I basically spent most of the time uh, just telling them, you know, this is what you did wrong and, and trying to, to uh, you know, correct things. So uh, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically the obsession well i wouldn't say well it is an obsession it has it to be is. an obsession right to uh get disinvolved into it i mean you you were uh, an investigator for over 30 35 years now yeah. um yeah so and you were doing this at a point where like the stigma was i mean it's okay for us now to come out as you know podcasters researchers investigators because it's safe, you know, because pioneers like you guys are the ones that you know, really took the brunt of, you know, the the cold shoulder that came with the, the territory of ufology, right? And uh, how does that feel? Like, how does that feel now? Like, is there, have you noticed that there's more of a warmth towards it now? Like, is it getting better? Well, it's, uh, it's you know, when I first started doing this, um, actually, I, you know, I got heavy into uh, to UFO investigations, uh, probably about, I guess it would be about 28 years or so ago, um, into, uh, you know, getting a website. Uh, my website, UFO Nuts, been out for about 24 years. And I picked UFO Nut because when I first started doing this, uh, you know, having the field investigations, people were calling me a nut. And instead of disregarding that and, 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 and not listening to the people and, and, and getting all, you know, emotional about it. I decided to, what the hell, you know, I own it. You know, I'm, you know, I'm a nut basically. I, you know, I, I've, I've investigated a lot of this stuff. People think I'm crazy. And so I created a website from it. And, and over the years, the, the UFO net became an acronym for unconventional flying objects. Uh, non-human, unrecognizable technology. I had to throw together an acronym. But, you know, when you own something like that, my license plate, even the ones I have from California, I don't know. Yeah, we can see them. UFO yeah. lover, UFO nut. Uh, yeah. You know, that was that's dated years ago when I lived in California over 20, 24 years ago. Um, you know, I just, I put myself out there. And it's really interesting when you do the amount of people that will come talk to you. Over the years now, because of uh, what's been happening in the past few years with the Pentagon pretty much getting serious and, you know, investigating UFOs, it's more of that aha moment for me, like I told you so. You know, I told you there was something flying around out here. You know, I told you there's a, there's a lot of interesting things and phenomenal uh, yeah. you know, things going on out of here. And you guys kind of just laughed at me. And now who's laughing? Yeah. Vindication. I'm kind of laughing back at you. Yeah, because yeah. you even had the boots on the ground investigating cattle mutilations, which, you know, it's not really common this side of the border on, you know, on the Canadian side, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but it happens a lot on the, you know, you discovered the 37th, uh, was it degree latitude parallel mm -hmm. um, that you discovered there was a trend there. Um, is that still active? It, it, it is. I mean, what's interesting is actually um, I've kind of like... Uh, uh, taken that particular uh, theory, 37 degree latitude, and matured it more over the past few years. Uh, it, because the more, uh, you know, the more investigations I do, the more I learn. Now, 37 degree latitude was one of those moments like, um, okay, something's going on, you know, uh, uh, this, this latitude shooting across the United States besides, <coughs> excuse me, having that, you know, cattle mutilations, UFO sightings, underground bases, Area 51, you know, one of them. Uh, a lot of military stuff, a lot of uh, Native American spiritual sites. And I started looking at that going, okay, there's something going on here. What is it? And the more you look into it, the more you have to think, okay, why there? Uh, you know, what's, what's the common denominator? Now, as a UFO investigator, one of the things I've always learned 
It's when you interview people, and then this is the case too when you're when you're a cop too. But if you interview three separate people about the same crime that they 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 you know they, they saw or they witnessed, or three people who actually saw a UFO sighting, you're going to get basically three different sides of their stories. Okay, it's not going to be one for one. But what I learned as a UFO investigator that I it helped me, you know, with when I was in law enforcement is you don't take each story word for word if it's coming from two or three different people because it's going to be all slightly different. But what you do is you find commonalities in every one of their stories and you focus on those commonalities. And that's the only way that you can actually start investigating if it's a crime or you're investigating, you know, a UFO because you'd be all over the place. You know, someone said it was, you know, uh, you know, north and the other place the east, and you know, it was this color or that color. Mm -hmm. But but when you look at the commonality that then you want to focus on that, at least it gives you something to go on. So um, that's something that I've always been doing in, in ufology. Now with the 37th degree latitude, I was looking at okay, so what's common with all this besides the underground bases and and uh, uh, you know the UFO sightings and animal meats and stuff. That's just the top part. That's just the icing of the cake. Why is all that happening, you know, on this 37th, actually a little bit in the 38th, a little bit in the 36th. Um, I, I started looking at the geology of, of, of that and I soon found out that the majority of aquifers, you know, underwater, uh, you know, containment, places uh, you know you can hit every one of our uh, aquifers across the united states on the 37 degree latitude and then i've always thought that ufos were um you know they liked water they 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 hung around water a lot for whatever reason and it didn't have to be deep it could be a couple three inches deep you know, if it's a stream or a water trough or something, but you see a lot of sightings were around water sources. So I started thinking about hydrogen, you know, something that that is easily, you know, accessible from, uh, you know, from water. And then then you start looking, okay, well, you have water sources across 37. Hydrogen is there because it's in the water. Then the next step, you know, as I more, I matured more and more, you know, on that theory, I learned that uh, there's a lot of underground uh, petroleum base uh, reserves, you know, or just pockets, you know. Uh, and uh, so now you have petroleum also. Now hydrogen can be extracted from petroleum. Hydrogen can be extracted easily from uh, water. Hydrogen can't be extracted from our oxygen or our air because we don't have that much hydrogen in our, in our air that we breathe. You know, we have uh, it's a lot of nitrogen and it's a lot of oxygen, but not hydrogen. But so if an alien species needed hydrogen for propulsion or to breathe or whatever, it, they can't easily access it just from our atmosphere, just from our from what we breathe. So that means they'd have to get it from water and they could get it from, um, uh, you know, natural resources, you know, petroleum based resources so it's uh, it's progressing more and more now and I, i'm even progressing beyond that too so. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense though right like hydrogen being such a basic element it's like the number one on the periodic table it's probably the most abundant in the universe so if you were going to make a machine that went interstellar you should base it on a fuel that you could get just about anywhere um so that, there's a lot of credence to that yeah absolutely matter of fact in the past couple of years uh, NASA has determined that there's more hydrogen in space than, than they thought. So space itself is just full of hydrogen. And then when you come here to this planet, you know, it's really hard for people to, to realize, you know, our, our, um, our planet is covered with water, what, 70, over 70%, right, covered with water. What they don't realize is there's more water underground than what we see above the ground. And right. you go, what? You know, there's there's more. I thought that's what we, you know, the oceans. I thought that was it. No, there's there's more underground water than than we see above ground. So we're a very very hydrogen enriched planet. 
Now, when you look at our natural resources, uh, you know, uh, with with oil or you know, any type of petroleum based product or, or petroleum based source, you, if you you can extract hydrogen hydrocarbons from that, and which led me to another theory back in November of last year that um, I think we would be able to find skinwalker type places or, or paranormal properties, if you will, across the US just based on a couple of things. First off, you look at water or you look at petroleum, uh, you know, reserve areas where they're extracting oil from. In those areas, if we happen, they have higher levels of EMF, electromagnetic fields. That means there's some type of, of apparatus, let's say, that's extracting you know, hydrogen from that and creating, it, creating an EMF field or EMF, EM field, excuse me. Yeah. And so you look at those areas, if you have a high level of electromagnetic field in a certain area, and that certain area has got uh, pockets of hydrogen or water or, you know, natural resources, crude oil or, or uh, you know, uh, natural gas. That might be an area to look at, especially if there's been UFO sightings in that area. So you kind of tie the three together. If, if, you, if you have an area where there's high levels of UFO sightings and there's water there and there's natural resources there, that might be an area where there could be a base. So there could be a truck stop, if you will, or something. And that would be one of the places to look at. The Skinwalker Ranch in Utah sits right on oil reserve. Hmm. San Luis Valley here in Colorado sits right on water. You know, uh, uh, there's, there's, you know, Bradford Ranch in Arizona sits on water and oil. I mean, there's so there's, there's areas where you, you, and I know a couple other ones I can't, I can't mention on this podcast, but um, that's something to look at. But you know, you, people have to understand that that there's no books that are written on this. We, you know, we're making this up as we go along, and we're making it up based on our best guesses and on data. And I like to look at data myself uh, because that makes it a lot harder for debunkers and skeptics to throw wrenches in your ideas where you say, you know, um, in November 12th, 2021, I have a, a, a blog that's called Alien Hydrogen Hypothesis, The Game Changer. And if you read that blog, I show actual, you know, maps of where the water is and, and where oil reserves are and areas where, where there's, you know, uh, UFO sightings and, and bases. And I just give it, you know, give it right out to, to the public and say, look, you know, there's something to this. Uh, and maybe we should look at that. Yeah. And how about mines? Um, have you noticed any connection with mines? Because I've spoken to a few people uh, that worked at mines and said that they've seen some stuff, you know, at night, uh, they would see black triangles. I've even putting a feel out there. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I lived in a mining town. <clears throat> That's where I saw my first UFO and uh, very up close and personal. So it was, you know, to me, always adamant on looking at mines, like what's the connection there? Because they seem to be attracted to minerals as well. So is there a lot of those along the, uh, the pathway as well, like on the 37th parallel? Well, not so much man-made, you know, uh, mines or crevices, more like caves. Right. Underground water sources, there's a lot, you know, uh, especially when you get into Missouri with the Merrimack Caverns and, you know, the Joplin Spook Lights, even that's in an area where there's a lot of caverns. Uh, Dulce, New Mexico, you know, there's caverns there. There's uh, mines in particular, that kind of falls into another theory. Um, and that goes back to, uh, you know, geez, and I'm trying to remember his name, who wrote the 12th planet. Um, you know, it goes back to the stories of the ancient Sumerians. Um, and and, and, and in, in their writings, they basically said, and this is just crazy stuff, you know, yeah, but, you know, but this is what the ancient Sumerians talked about, that there was, there were beings that came to this planet 
And at the time, they were like these walking upright hominids, you know, sort of like a lot of Bigfoots, you know, running around. And and uh, they crossed, you know, DNA with those guys and created kind of like slaves to to mine uh, what we call gold in what we call Africa now. And ancient Sumerians talk about that. Um, the reason why supposedly they mined the gold was to repair the atmosphere on their own planet. And, you know, these are great stories. And it's stuff that I've, you know, I've read 25, 30 years ago. But I just, I'm just so, so sorry. I just drew a, a complete block on the, the author, but he wrote a few books about it. One called The Twelfth Planet. Was it uh, Zachariah Sitchin? Zachariah Sitchin, thank you very much. My man, he it. always knows the names. <laughs> yeah, you know, I met him and it got him to sign one of the books. He's such a cool guy. But luckily, I got to meet him before he passed. But he basically was just looking at scrolls that were, you know, dug up. And he was just reading them, deciphering them verbatim what they were saying. Uh, the skeptics were saying, well, those scrolls were, you know, the stories were probably from a library where they just made stories up. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing is, is why would ancient Sumerians of the ancestors of, of, you know, of the ancient Egyptians, why would they even think about a story about space travelers and, and, and needing a particular type of mineral to, to, you know, save their atmosphere. Now it's interesting because we were kind of toying with that here, you know, with HARP a few years ago about seeding, remember that whole thing with chemtrails, that whole, that whole phenomenon about chemtrails. And I've actually, well, actually watched jets lay down chemtrails when I lived in California. They were seeding the atmosphere, you know, to try and, and uh, you know, fix the ozone, you know, uh, holes in the ozone layer. And they were using different types of minerals. Now gold happens to, uh, you know, um, be very, very conductive. And we use it in microchip design as one of the metals to conduct current. So, uh, you know, if you sprinkle the atmosphere with conductive metals like aluminum and gold, and then you shoot, uh, you know, uh, microwaves towards them and, and, you know, what they'll do is, you know, it'll excite the electrons or protons in the metals. You know, that was a theory that, you know, that's how they were kind of like fixing the ozone. But it's really interesting when you hear 5,000 year ago, you're reading about 5,000 year ago, uh, you know, readings you know, or, 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 you know, these scrolls that were deciphered that, that basically talked about the same thing. Just makes you, makes you wonder, that's all. I mean, you can't, you can't say that was fact, you know, unless you know for, for a fact, but you can, like, Staten Freeman always said, you put that information in your gray basket. You leave it there because they may pop up in the future and you may need it, you know, like this conversation tonight. Wait. Sure. I wanted to ask you, since you're a super techie guy and a microchip engineer and all the rest, what do you think about like superconductors, like these metals that have to be held at like minus 400 and then they have these like crazy properties of propulsion or energy i just recently started reading about it and i think it's very cool are you familiar with much about these yeah yeah you know uh it's it's interesting technology and they're still kind of toying with it uh whether or not we can actually apply it without destroying ourselves you know it makes <laughs> sense in in the like uh universe if you were going to travel i mean it's minus several hundred so having yeah. things that work really well at that temperature I, I don't know. It seemed to uh, it jived a little bit. I thought, hey, this is kind of cool. I wonder if there's anything to it. Well, I think um, I've always thought that, you know, the problem with us humans is we always relate traveling to speed, you know, yeah. 186,000 miles an hour, speed of light or whatever, right? And we can never go past that. But, you know, it's, but yet, there's craft that's coming into our atmosphere. Matter of fact, I think it was the Pentagon reclassified the UAPs and they added uh, that type of vehicle that can travel from space in the air and then, you know, and underwater type of thing. So they're actually, craft. yeah, so they're expanding the definition. 
But these things, you know, they're traveling faster than than our your know, best fighter jets can travel and moving on a dime, you know, uh, making right angle type maneuvers, traveling extremely fast through the atmosphere and going right into the ocean at that same speed, not even slowing down, which means, you know, the metals, the metallurgy that they're using is far, far beyond our, uh, you know, our capability because it doesn't collapse. Who's ever inside that craft, um, it, they don't have to worry about G-force like we do. There's something going on in there that doesn't crush them, you know, or whatever that craft is doing isn't associated with G-force like with us. It's not associated with speed. So when you start traveling through space, are you warping space? Are you opening your wormholes or, do, or, or are you moving through folds of space? I mean, so we have to look at other things other than just speed. The super semiconductor uh, or superconductor is is one way of looking at, but you know, you're still strapped to speed with that. Um, other things they're looking at, you know, is just utilizing the hydrogen itself and and slowly build up. But then you have the, that whole, you know, uh, Einstein theory of you know, the faster you go, time slows and you know, and if we build something fast now to go towards the end of uh, of our you know uh, of our solar system and it takes 10 years or 20 years to get there like voyager right and within the next 10 years we build something a little faster it'll pass that one up and then in 10 years we build something it'll pass that you know so it's uh it's one of those never-ending things uh as technology increases even speed of light i mean if something is hundreds of millions of light years away that's still many millions of years is a one way trip, right? So nobody has that amount of time. So we have, if there is such a thing as these craft coming and going, they're moving faster than the speed of light. Just yeah, the, the, but they, the, they have, but you see, they could, they could actually still be within the realm of our physics by not actually moving yeah. faster than the speed of light. Yeah, you know, they're just they're just jumping from Dimension. one spot to another. You know. Um, I had a physicist one time, you know, explain to me, you know, about, you know, you know, going through not, not a wormhole or, or folding space, but you take a bowling ball and you drop it on your bed and the edges of your bed get closer to close, you know, get closer because you drop the bowling ball in the middle. Well, you know, you've had a bed that was just, you know, this long and now it's only this long. You're only traveling that far by, you know, by altering that space. And so once we can figure that out and just alter space, you know, um, then we don't have to worry about the speed of light. We don't have to worry about, you know, G-force or affecting us or time or anything. Now, matter of fact, um, it wasn't until recently that I actually thought or actually realized that Albert Einstein was a real man, you know, because all my life I've only known him as a theoretical physicist. Right. <laughs> it took me a joking. moment it <laughs> took me a second <laughs> but uh, so of all the years of that you've been doing this you've had people obviously criticizing you or you know saying you know opposite of what you're saying Stanton Friedman used to foam at the mouth at his critics because his critics you know would just judge him by all the work that he's done they haven't done anything they would just read through and go well I disagree with you uh, while well, he was actually on the ground, and you're one of those people that was on the ground, you're you know you were elbow deep in it. Um, how do you feel about the critics? Like, how does that make you feel now that uh, you know the truth is sort of coming out slowly through you know the Congress and stuff? Like, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, um, I always call them couch investigators. Right. You know, yeah, basically what they see on TV, and then they just make the you know opinions and assumptions based on that, with actually not even going in the field. Uh, now, like I said, it's just kind of like, you know, when it first came out that, uh, you know, 144 uh, sightings were investigated and only one, you know, they could figure out, they could actually figure out it was a balloon. And then 143 were unknowns. That was an aha moment for me because that kind of like throws it like, okay, look, we have, you know, the NSA, CIA, uh, Air Force, Army, Navy, they were all involved in trying to, uh, you know, figure out what these fighter pilots are seeing. And 
and it can it became an unknown well they call it you know other you know yeah. the document they release but you know other is basically a ufo or or uap and uap uap isn't any any it's not a real act a real new acronym it's nothing that just came up this time. I mean, UAP, that acronym has been used back in the late 50s. So it's just, you know, just coming out again. But it basically means the same thing. The, the cool part is, is, you know, being involved in microchip design, like the company I'm contracting for, I'm a contractor. I don't, I don't work uh, as a salary person. And the reason I don't work as a salary person is because as a contractor, if I need to blow off, to do an investigation or do something, or even a you know podcast in the daytime, I can do that. If your salary, it's a little harder. So about twenty years ago, you know, um, I decided to just go full time contracting, and that way I had the time, you know, to uh, to do what I need to do. But when I with contracting, I've worked at so many different companies: Intel, you know, uh, Qualcomm, and Rockwell, and Western Digital, I mean, all these, all these biggies that some of the projects I've been involved with, uh, it, it's, 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 it's interesting where you deal with the technology and you get this, like I mentioned before, you get this idea of, you know, what we really should have and what we could have uh, based on, you know, uh, what people are perceiving we might have. And then some of these, these couch investigators go, well, you know, you can't do that. I went, well, actually, we're kind of doing it now. If you mm -hmm. knew anything about technology, it was really interesting. Years ago, we <laughs> interviewed a guy out of Missouri. He just way off in the, in the boondocks. And and um, remember the Harrier jet? Remember those? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, he had seen one on TV and it, and it flipped him out. He had no idea that we had that technology. And the Harrier had been out for decades. You know, so then again, too, it's, it's not his fault. It's just that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, that just never get introduced to, you know, the technical side of, of things. And, uh, you yeah, know, when they see it, uh, another real quick one I have. To, so we are at Disneyland over last uh, last weekend and uh, they have, you know, they have like a Marvel Studios section in California Adventure and, and they have an animatronic Spider-Man. And they have like a, a a a character, you know, actor that plays Spider Man, and he's kind of like jumping around and parkour, doing things back and forth. And he says, "Okay, now I'm really going to try this suit out and see what it really does." And he kind of runs around a building. And what people don't know is Disney's got this animatronic Spider Man that they launch like 50, 60 feet in the air. And it and then it does flips. It's a robot, you know. And they launch it. It's free falling. It does all these flips. And what the what the public doesn't see is it comes down on a on a net. And I and I'm standing there watching this thing, and it was pretty cool. But the people beside me on both sides, oh my god, oh my god, and they're <laughs> flipping out. They're like, how, how can that be done? Oh my god, how can well, you know, if you watch Disney Plus, they they would they would have known, but but when you're in a technical aspect of things, you're saying, oh, yeah, well, yeah, no human could do that because it's the G-force of them launching it. So it's got to be some type of animatronic. And <laughs> Disney's real good with that. Once again, that's those people who, you know, aren't familiar with technology just kind of flip out. And that's just Disney. So can you imagine if they saw a UFO, what they would think? Yeah. I like the theory, too, that uh, was it help it off that... Um theorize that the they might be coexisting with us that we just don't know that they're here uh we're just starting now to pay attention to them well we now have the technology to detect them same way as uh you know some tribes in some countries that have no outside influences they're still living the way that they've lived for thousands of years and then all of a sudden they see drones or planes fly by like they're aware that something's going on in the outside world but it doesn't affect them directly until Maybe they step out of their zone and they start discovering that there's more to the world. So I, I think that's a, an interesting theory. Like that's something else that I personally have not explored before. And now that it's being brought forward, I'm like, it's possible. You know, it's 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 very much a, a possibility that they're oh, yeah. been living here for a long time. Oh, absolutely. I've had 
I've had the pleasure of uh, interviewing and meeting Native Americans here in the four corner regions of Colorado. Not so much when I lived in Col in California, but out here in Colorado, and and to hear some of their stories that have been told down through generations of the star travelers and all kinds of things. I mean, it goes back way before Europeans even migrated to North America. Some of the things, not only just aliens, but, you know, Sasquatch, you know, Bigfoot also. So this is, this is something that they've been aware of for, you know, centuries. And that, that we're just now getting introduced to in some cases. But when you talk to Native Americans, you know, uh, you know when I was, uh, we were doing our episode on skin, you know, that week, well, it was outside of Skinwalker Ranch in Utah for Alien Highway. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, interviewing a Native American elder with the U Tribe. And U Tribe is very prevalent and very common here in Colorado and then also in Utah. And so I was interviewing him first before we went on camera. Unfortunately, his interview never made it on the TV show because we had so much stuff. But it was just so cool to talk to him because I said, well, you know, uh, Native Americans, because I've talked to them, I know that they have names for, you know, UFOs and they, you know, colonists have different names, you know, depending on the tribe. And then they have different names for Bigfoot. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and, uh, I said, but you know, um, the gray aliens himself, that's kind of interesting. And he goes, oh, you mean da 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 da? You know? And he plopped out a Ute name for a gray alien. And I'm going, the Ute tribe <laughs> has a name for the gray alien. He goes, and he goes, I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> oh. I go, well, you know, it's okay. I'll talk about it, but you'll never, you'll have to say it on camera. Uh, certain things that they can't talk about but um that was that particular word that they used for gray aliens has been around for a long long time so it's nothing new um it didn't mean gray alien basically uh, it, it refers more like to ant people and not because they look like ants but because they come out of the ground mm -hmm. okay underground bases let's say and matter of fact, um, two Native American elders slash storytellers that kind of keep the stories going from generation to generation. One was Apache, one was Navajo. Uh, both of them I talked to within a couple of years apart, so not together. And I got about the same story from both of them, okay? That uh, as far as they were concerned, there's four species living on this planet beside us, okay? So um, I don't know their name, but it kind of translates to the blues. And the blues are these little two feet guys that come out of mountains. And, you know, they're more of the protectors of the earth. Now I wrote a blog about that not too long ago, because as it turns out, leprechauns, you know, out of Ireland, uh, you have Tommy knockers that you know came out of um, oh uh, out of old England uh, area. Um, I just forgot the name anyway. And then you have the Manahunis, which came out you know which are in Hawaii. They're all about the same height. Now the Native Americans also have names for these little guys that are about two feet tall. And they've had names for them for centuries. You know for, so. That could be a species that not only derived here, but you know, people seen in Hawaii and Ireland, and of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, Europe with the Tommy knockers, and we're still getting stories about it. So those are the blues. Then you have the the uh, ant people, which basically are the grays because they come out of the ground. Then they have the snake people, which we refer to as the reptilians. And they're taller and they call them snake people because they're very snake-like. These guys, now the the snake or the the ant people come out of the ground, they have their own agenda. So it wasn't like the Native Americans were afraid of them, but they have their own agenda and you don't bug them because they they'll bug you back. But the snake people basically 
were bad guys, or maybe they still are. And, uh, you know, so much so that, you know, they were afraid of them. And then they had what they call the giants, or, or, or there's other names that they use for them, you know, Nephilims or whatever you want to call it, tall blondes, what you want to call it. Those guys basically had condos here on this planet and they come visit and they would keep everything in check. And, you know, if the, if the reptilians or the snake people were, were being too aggressive or whatever, you know, they would put them in check because they, they seem to be the space cops, you know, type right. of thing. But that's kind of how they, 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 you know, and that was just a poor species. Um, me in particular, I'm just trying to find one. <laughs> <laughs> i like the space cop idea i think that'd be a fantastic show wouldn't it be like cops but like space cops you know space cops well well you know um travis wall have you guys interviewed travis walton no not yet no not yet no yeah well you gotta interview travis walton because back in 75 when he was abducted and he was gone for what five six days whatever it was he actually saw grays and the tall blondes. You saw right. two different species, and uh, I've been, I've lectured with him a few times, uh, and, and you know got to talk to him about it. And you know, he's one of those guys where, you know, he I don't know how many polygraph either five or six times he's been polygraphed and he's never failed one. Yeah. And the uh, the guys that the lumberjacks that he worked with, um, they've never failed. A polygraph too there was a couple instances where they said that it was inconclusive because a couple of guys you know they didn't answer some of the questions because they were mad or whatever but um or for whatever reason but they've never really you know failed a polygraph so there's some you know there, there's some validity to that at least with the tall bonds or the nephilims or whatever you want to call them and then you know the ant people or the grays and being somebody of science, I, I, we're going to ask you this because Louis and I are huge fans of Bob Lazar. So we believe Bob Lazar, we believe his story is, is true and the, the way he's describing the crafts and, and, and you know being able to operate and all that. So we, huge supporters of Bob Lazar. What are your thoughts on Bob Lazar? Now that we're putting you on the spots, but uh, just... I don't know. The, I got a, I got a back in the background somewhere. Is Bob Lazar's ship, the sport model back there. Nice. <laughs> you know... Uh, no, I, 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 I actually, I believe him. Yeah, I know that, um, I had talked with Stanton Freeman when he was, you know, when he was alive, we, we lectured a few times at the same time. And I just, you know, at dinners and stuff, I just bullshit with him. And, and he wasn't really a Bob Lazar fan, but I think at one point towards the end, um, he found a phone book or something, or somebody found a phone book at one of the places he claimed he worked at that they said he never did. And at Rockwell, when I worked at Rockwell quarterly, you phone books would go out quarterly back in the day, you know, paper phone books. Oh, wow. And, quarterly. Yeah, about quarterly or so, because people are coming and going. So quarterly, right. they go, you know, and then I remember the first time I saw my name in the phone book at Rockwell. Going, yeah, you know, like Steve Mark, I'm somebody, I'm somebody, you know. The I'm going to call my own number. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it works. <laughs> yeah. But, um. So it was one of the quarterly phone books that they found that had Bob Lazar's name in it yeah. at the place that he claimed he worked at and they claimed he never worked at. So there was, you know, finally Stad goes, well, you know, I still don't think he's, uh, you know, a you know, nuclear physicist like me or whatever, but uh, not me, Stan Freeman, but um, Lazar is pretty smart, you know, and then he came out, God, what is that? Is it, was it element one fifth? 115 yeah yeah so he came out with that a decade before the russians discovered it remember that's my the... biggest sticking point how do you do that like and okay you could guess if it was the next one or two in line but he guessed the properties of what that would actually do that it would mm -hmm. make good nuclear fuel like did he actually guess or just did he know yeah <laughs> yeah 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 that was the that was the issue so yeah i put a lot of validity in what bob lazar says and when I lived in California, I was a real stickler for uh, Area 51 anyway. In the background, too, there's some pictures oh, over there somewhere of Area 51 that I shot 26 years or so ago. Right, right after Freedom Ridge was taken, I was going to go to Freedom Ridge and take pictures of Area 51. But um, 
Freedom Ridge was taken, uh, land grabbed by Nellis. And I was like probably one of the first three or four people that uh, cut the trail up Tickaboo Peak, uh, which was, I think you can still get to Tickaboo Peak now. Um, I had hired a guide at, uh, you know, out of Rachel, Nevada, a lady, and we drove like, I don't know, 15, 16 miles all around and got to the backside of Tickaboo Peak and hiked up. And it was really interesting, too, because when I, when, when I showed up, there was two other individuals. One definitely was military. Hell, he was in camels, you know, uh, and, uh, and the other guy would look like a surfer. Uh, actually, the surfer guy was the one I was more concerned about than the military guy because, you know, if there's going to be a there's going to be an undercover agent. He's going to come across as some, yeah. you know, some guy going, "Hey, dude!" Um, but they wanted to. Uh, I happened to have a, a four by four, and I had enough room, so I took them to along with a guide, and we went to Tigabu Peak and we hiked to the top and and took pictures. I took pictures of it. But see, you're still still 18, 19 miles away from it. But out of the pictures, I there's there's one picture I took where something was going across, and I was able to catch it you know, going across over, uh, you know, so it was pretty cool. The other cool thing about that was about three o'clock or so while we were up there, um, there was a security change. You know, that was, that was the, the, the one type of the day where, you know, they changed personnel and security. And so you're looking at this barren desert, right? And every 51's out there distance. And at three o'clock, it just comes alive. All these vehicles are moving back and forth, coming and going. Out of nowhere, so there was these, you know, either these, uh, you know, camouflage berms or whatever or whatever, but it, it, it just like they just it suddenly appeared, moved back and forth. I go, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, I did talk to uh, the, the military guy afterwards uh, because you know uh, every time I take a picture, he got out of the way. You know, he would never get in. I did finally got a frame of the back side of him in it, and. Uh, we got back to uh, to the little alien inn, and, and right behind it, there was a, a trailer park or, or a RV park. And I had an RV at the time, a small one, that I pulled my my four by four with. And as he took off, and the surfer guy took off, and the and the guy took off, I held back a little bit, and I walked around and watched to see what he got into. And he got into a trailer that was being pulled by a blue SUV, like a Ford Explorer back in the day. Now, back in the day, blue SUVs was what the private security were using at Area 51. So he got in the trailer and I waited a couple of minutes and then I walked up and I knocked on the trailer door and I said, Cap Ground Security. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he opened the door and I looked inside and he had this headlight, you know, during the headlight look, right? And he says, and he looked at me and I go, oh, it's just the duffel bag. All you have, there's nothing else. The trailer was empty, right? It's not camping. He just had a duffel bag. And he looked at me and I said, dude, it's obvious. I'm, I'm no threat, am I? He goes, nah, you're no threat. You're just some UFO nut. Well, that's what I had on my plates, California plates, UFO nut. And I said, 15 minutes off the record? He goes, yeah. And we, I went in and he gave me a beer. We sat down for 15 minutes and we totally bullshit it for you know, off the record of, of what was going on. The bottom line was, is, you know, um, he was there because um, they were kind of, well, they, they they were monitoring emails and the phones from from Rachel, Nevada area. And then so they knew I was coming in. They wanted to find out what I was all about. And so he was there. Uh, and uh, uh, I asked him, I said, so, uh, is there going to be a report written on this? He goes, oh, yeah. Your name's going to be all over it. I said, oh, boy, Joy, where's that going? Nellis, where? You know, he goes, I can't tell you. You know, it's just I turned it in. The the, the, the funny part of that story is this when uh, I did a polygraph for the sheriff's department after I passed, you know, uh, the written and everything and the verbal and now I'm doing the polygraph and then and a polygraph tester, you know, he asked me, he says, do you have any, any records on you? You know, and he was like, like a criminal record is what he meant. And I said, well, I might have a file on me somewhere in the government. And he stops and he goes, okay, explain it. <laughs> and I told him the story. And he goes, and then so, um, 
he turns the machine back and he says, okay, other than that Area 51 incident, do you have any type of you know, record with, you know, some type of law enforcement, you know, criminal record. And I said, no, and I passed the polygraph. So it's funny how things come back later on. <laughs> Always a paper trail for sure. There is, there is. So who knows who's got it. So where can people find you, Chuck, if they want to follow your adventures and what you're working on, where can they find you? Well, oh, oh, UFOnut.com. Uh, that's UFOnut.com. Actually, I own it now. So I own UFOnut. Um, nice. during, during COVID, I trademarked it. Uh, the website's an LLC. So everything I put on the website, I just, uh, you know, there's no charge on my website. I never charge any fees or anything. I just, you know, I do an investigation and, and I put it out there. Um, I'm working on an investigation right now. Um, really cool. Really, really cool. It's probably another one of these areas that's sort of like a Skinwalker Ranch type of area. Uh, over here in Colorado, where uh, their uh, security cameras have picked up metallic craft. Really cool. I wish I could share the pictures with you right now, but I can't, unfortunately. But you can clearly see something going boom, boom, bam, and just shooting off. It is like, what? And then I just got some more day, uh, some more video from just not too long ago where something flies by and it disrupts the uh, camera so the camera goes you know so there's an em field there's yeah. this and that's something that i've always talked about was you know these things that the one thing the one denominator with all this is electromagnetic fields and we can use the electromagnetic fields because there's enough evidence at least in the years i've been doing this that we might be able to track using emf you know, and then if the EMF is coming from an area where it's high in water or high in, in, in uh, you know, natural resources, you know, oil and stuff, then there may be a reason why that EMF is there. Maybe they are extracting the hydrogen. Uh, it's kind of interesting stuff. You know, it's just like I said, it's you know, when you get in law enforcement, there's books and books and books you can read about law enforcement. But when it comes to ufology, you know, there's really not a lot, you know, 37 parallel basically is just, you know, about how I started off and the things that I've done and the people that I've worked with and, and the new cases and stuff. And the ending is kind of cryptic. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you real quick, the ending. Okay. Now, uh, Ben Mesrick wrote that and he told me about the ending. And the reason why it's kind of ended that way is because at the time, um, I was referring to Bass, you know, the, the billionaire that uh, is in charge of, uh, of Bass. And, uh, I, and there were some issues at the time because, um, you know, uh, I didn't want to get sued, but I knew he was part of uh, the funding from the CIA or from somewhere, some of the things, what he was doing he was working with the government. He just wasn't by himself. And as it turned out, uh, I think it was in 2017, it came out that when the Pentagon released documents that, that they had a $22 million project, you know, he was, his name was mentioned. So, um, but that's why some of that cryptic stuff and then the sightings and stuff like you. But just to clarify, we're talking about Robert Bigelow, correct? We're talking about. I didn't want to say it, but go ahead, Robert Bigelow. I guess I'm gonna get shot now. Great. <laughs> oh no, dude. No, well, no, because it was reminiscent. We chat with George Knapp. He tells us the same thing, right? Like he went from Bass to NIDS to OSAP yeah. to ATIP, and the 22 million dollar budget was kind of a little bit incorrectly reported by New York Times, and but nonetheless, yeah, he's been the guy. I think it was. Who do we talk to recently, Jay? And we said, who do you think's behind all this? And he said, I'm pretty sure Robert Bigelow is still behind the scenes, even though he's not. Oh, oh, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, you know, a lot of people seem to think that. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I crossed paths with Bigelow when I was with MUFON and I was on the STAR team. And I had a cattle mutilation investigation with the UFO sighting. That was going to be the very, very first STAR investigation for MUFON. And STAR teams are, you know, those individuals in MUFON that are highly experienced investigators. And so they're they're part of an elite group called the Star King. You know. And Robert Bigelow was funding that. 
And I found out just from being an investigator that uh, he was he was funding it, but it wasn't funding it with his own money. And uh, just only because there was a lot of evidence that kind of pointed that way. I mean, it didn't come out directly, but it just there was a lot of things that just didn't make sense as an investigator what was going on. And then when I did the cattle mutilation, it was a Mike Duran mutilation. And I put together a team and I funded it. And we all went out there and did the investigation. And when we came back and he was supposed to reimburse me and my team, and he says, no, no, I'm not gonna do it because um, I'm only gonna do those cases where there's actually evidence of a UFO, meaning physical evidence of a UFO. I mean, yeah, you're an idiot. There's not gonna be evidence, physical evidence. I have a dead <laughs> cow for crying out loud. You can get <laughs> much more evidence than this. We got a dead cow and <laughs> bio samples and stuff. And now you want him going. And then later we found that uh, that that his his own investigative team that worked for Bass, they were they were jumping MUFON's teams. There's only it's like okay, so every time there's a, a MUFON would send out an investigator, um or anytime there was a, some type of event, if it's a star event, it's, it's one of those events where something phenomenal happened. And so they send the star team out. But they have to ask Robert Bigelow first. They have to send that sighting to him. This is not now, but back in the day. And he would approve it, meaning, okay, I'll, I'll fund that. But it would take a couple of days for him to come back and say, okay, we'll fund that. Well, within that couple of days, we found out, and I was... Uh, you know, at the time, I think I was assistant director of Colorado, and I knew all the other directors, some of the other directors in other states. He was sending his own team out there, and they were jumping move on because a couple of our guys would show up to interview the witness, and they'd say, well, you're already here. You guys are already here. You were here two days ago. Go, no, we weren't. We we're here now. He goes, no, you guys are already here. Well, Bigelow would send his own guys out first. Keeping all the juicy pieces for himself, right? Exactly. Were they going up pretending to be MUFON? Well, I don't know. I, mean, I, I don't know if that's a case or they just showed up and, and said they were, you know, the investigators assigned to it. But I know it happened at least, well, three times. And um, and then I crossed paths with him again when uh, my sister and I found a piece of metal debris during a sanctioned archaeology dig at, at, uh, at Roswell, at the debris site. We were doing a a show for a sci-fi channel. It's a real long story, but the bottom line is, is they just wanted volunteer investigate or uh, uh, volunteer archaeologists there, uh, just for background while they're shooting the, the TV show. And Debbie and I were actually my sister Debbie is the on the board of directors for MUFON, and she's a uh, state director in MUFON of Missouri. And so we were there. And out of all the, the volunteers, we're the only two investigators besides the hosts, which were Don Schmidt and Tom Carey. But we're digging and we're doing all that stuff. And we realized that we were in the wrong place and not where I wanted to be and on and on because I, I'd been Roswell a few times. Matter of fact, Glenn Dennis, um, I knew him uh, back in the day because I used to, uh, Roswell was, was my deal, man. I was really, you know, Living in California, I always hit Roswell every time he went on vacation. And uh, Glenn Dennis and Walter Hot knew me. Glenn Dennis gave me the GPS coordinates to the debris site, actually to the BLM marker that was near the debris site and told me how to get there. But so we found, oh, so the bottom line is, is I realized that we were in the right, in the wrong area, only based on um, erosion over, you know, 60 years or whatever it was. And I wanted to be over here. The, the Everybody on the TV, they wanted us over here. And so when they finally packed up to leave, um, we asked Dr. Bill Goldman if we could come back another day while he's out there picking up stuff until we do our own dig to the place that I wanted to dig, where, where over decades, the water, due to erosion, would move maybe some of the debris. Why? Because that's logical thinking. Yeah, You just... Don't look at the place where it came down. You have to think about what happened, you know, over the decades with rain and, you know, high winds and stuff. So um, we did. And, and I used a technique called, uh, uh, well, it's it's basically uh, one by five meter uh, skimming dirt off of the top. Uh, you only have to go down that deep 
to get back down to the 40s. And they had us going down Jurassic period. Um, so I was strip digging is what I was. And so I was strip digging and my sister Debbie was, was uh, you know, sh she was shaking the dirt and looking and we found a little piece of metal and uh, had a bag. And then um, we tried to get sci-fi to analyze it more. We tried to get the UFO Museum in Roswell and, and they did. So I got a hold of piece. Um, at the time I was contracting at a company over here that had an electron scanning microscope downstairs and just so happened the operator that electron scanning microscope was in the UFOs. So mm -hmm. after an hour, I took a piece in there and we, we checked it out as aluminum silicon alloy with uh, trace elements of titanium under eight inches of dirt out in the middle of the desert, right? Like, right. What? So then I did a press release at Roswell and who do you think answered the press release to do lab analysis on it? Robert Bigelow. And uh, so he did, or his lab did. And I'm not stupid. I, I had the, the, the museum in, uh, in, uh, or the archaeology place in New Mexico who had the debris. Um, I talked to them and we did all the documentation. I had them cut a piece of it off for Robert Bigelow. So there's still a piece left in archive. And so that piece went to Robert Bigelow. Within one week, I got an email from the lab scientist saying it's an unknown polymer based on the known polymers that the lab has, you know, uh, like the book of polymers or whatever, you know, of known polymers. But it's an unknown polymer based on all our just regular polymers that we use, which tells me now it's not anything that's very common, right? It's, it could still be from this planet, but it's not, you know, backside of duct tape or it's not yeah. aluminum from a bubble gum wrapper. Yeah. It's not a conventional but, explanation, right? Yeah, yeah. But they just said it's an unknown polymer. Doesn't mean it's, it's you know, that it's a UFO. That's fine. But it's still a huge because it's a piece of, uh, you know, aluminum second alloy. It's an unknown polymer. And that's a lot more than most people would expect that came out of eight inches of dirt in the middle of the desert, right? So um, never heard from him again, if you read the book, right? A year later, I mean, I even went over to the Bass over in Las Vegas. I didn't actually drive out there on purpose. I just happened to be in the area and then went back to see if there was any way to get into Bass. Um, I got an email back about a year or so later saying, oh, it was nothing. But you told me it was not on Palmer. Oh, and they also told me when I asked them, okay, what was next? What, you, what a type of analysis are you going to do next? And they said, well, you know, we're going to see if it's, you know, from, from this planet. We're going to do another analysis and see if it's actually from this planet. Um, anyway, a year later, you know, I finally get it back. And you know, actually, the museum got it back. And they said, well, it, it was nothing. The cool thing is though, about that time period, I know from what the Pentagon was saying, what they were funding, but we knew that they were funding before that because I found not hard evidence that, that Bigelow was being funded You know, when the star team was going on. So I think that little piece of metal might've been part of the Pentagon you know, money, like in other words, the Pentagon was analyzing it through Bigelow, which is pretty cool, yeah. I think, because now, you know, it's like, oh, uh, Pentagon knows about that piece. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, yeah. it just, you, you got to keep digging. Maybe you'll find a, an actual craft one of these days or something uh, substantial, yeah. you know, like. That's the thing is you've actually been there. You've been on the ground. You've done this work and uh, a lot more than what we can say in an hour's time uh, for the amount of work that you've done. And uh, no, we thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Chuck. It's, well, thank it's, you. Yeah, it's it's great to have you on here. Louis, do you have any final questions for our guest no, today? No, just also big thanks again. It's always, uh, we're younger guys. We've been in this for a long time, but only last couple of years doing shows, interviewing guys such as yourself and uh yeah it's inspirational you know you you piqued our interest many years ago and it's great to chat with you in person and uh find out that you're still hard at it so uh keep doing what you're doing a lot of people appreciate it and you do a very good job so thank you well, for thank that. you thank you i mean just just you know um 
you hit my website every now and then, you'll phone that, anything that I find new. I mean, I'm working on a couple of things right now. COVID kind of like messed things up, unfortunately, you know. For a lot of people, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that I was working on. But like I said, that one investigation I'm kind of working on. And then I have something else now that uh, just popped up this last week. And uh, whatever information I get, you know, I just put it on my website for everybody to, you know, read. And then the bottom line is, is everything, anything on my website, challenge me. You know, I mean, that's how I learn too. Right. Um, if, I, if I'm going in the wrong direction, challenge me on it. Tell me why'd you go there. I mean, I, I can't know everything. So that's why I do it. Uh, you know, the information is, is not to be etched in stone. It's to be discussed. Yeah. Well said. Chuck Zukowski, thank you so much for your time. And thank, thank you for joining us on UAP Studies. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you. Of course.